I have been considering as of late what all is involved in being saved. And we hear a lot of chatter about this in the churches of our day. We hear a lot of people say, I got saved. Well, when did you get saved? Like it's some kind of a certificate or something we have that, you know, we hang on the wall or uh, maybe something they place on their shelf and they can, they can take it down when they need it. Well, I, I, thought, I thought I might get saved, you know, just in case I ever needed it, you know. As we were talking about it last Sunday morning in connection to our, our text this evening, I began to think about this phrase, once saved, always saved, you know. And as I thought about it, I realized that those who teach this, they've made this same mistake as well. That two words into the phrase, they've, we're already in, in the wrong direction. Once saved. Well, salvation is not a one-time thing. So this, we're already off on the, on, on the wrong foot. To be saved is a work. To be saved is, is a continuance in Christ. To be saved is, is, a, is a journey. It is to be brought into the way. It is to be led along the way and finally arrive at a destination. From this perspective, our salvation is like a threefold salvation, so to speak. We have been saved. We have entered into and have become partakers of the salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Yet it's also true that we are in process of being saved. Uh, we are um, being transformed. We're being sanctified. We're, we're being um, changed to a, a greater and a fuller sense into the image of Christ, going from glory to glory, from faith to faith. And yet there's another perspective from which we can view salvation and that there's a point in time in which we will be saved. Finally and completely exonerated from any and all ag agitations of the flesh and, and hindrances and um, these type of things. Once we've been finally and completely saved, once we're divorced from this body of death and the jeopardy of this world, we will never fall. But in the present, there's really nothing eternal about our security. Our security depends upon a present reliance and continuance in this provision of safety that the Lord has given us. Now, all three of these perspectives are expounded in our text this evening. Now, I had, I had done a message on the first two verses that um, uh, Sister Sarah had quoted here on my series of abundance, and I'd wanted to uh, speak um, had, concerning the next few verses as well, but I didn't really have the opportunity then. So I'll be doing an uh, um, overview of um, a, a few of these verses here, and it's in uh, 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Um, I'm going to start off reading after what she read. Who are kept by the... the by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen ye love, and whom now though ye see him not, yet believing, ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Now something that I noticed about our text is, is the high perspective from which Peter is addressing our salvation. I, I realized as I was thinking about it that he didn't even say anything about our rescue from depravity or, or our sins being forgiven. He, he goes right to the heart of the matter. He's speaking about the purpose of our salvation, about the real core issue. And I, as I was um, thinking about this, I was reminded of when I was, young, when I was younger, um, I went to a church with some friends I had in high school, and I don't, I don't ever remember hearing anything as, as it concerns Jesus other than that he died and he forgave our sins. And I, we went with this church for three, three and a half years, every single week, and um, we didn't really, they never really said anything about that. Uh, the, the fact is that the, uh, contrary to the persuasion of most professing believers in our day, rescue from depravity and from sin is, is not the totality of salvation. Uh, the remissions of sins is something that had to be done um, as, pre as preparatory work, so to speak. This is like the, the foundation for the house that's going to be the habitation of God and the Spirit. Now, I was thinking about this. It's probably not the best example, but... 
You know, um, in high moisture areas, men, they have to use materials that are specifically treated to be waterproof, you know. Uh, men would never dream of, of using things that have a propensity to rot when they're exposed to the elements, you know. So in redemption, we, we kind of had to be pre-treated, so to speak, before we could be used in the building project of God. You know, we had to be rot-proof, so to speak, if we're going to be put in the building of God, you know. Anyways, before I digress too far, as it concerns the first two verses of our text, this lively hope that the apostle speaks of and this inheritance that does not fade away, that's reserved in heaven for you. Who is the you in this, in this sentence? Who, who is it that this, this reservation in heaven is, is waiting for? Those who are kept by the power of God through faith. Now, it, it, it is those who are kept who are afforded this inheritance. They are the ones who have this reservation in heaven. Now, if this is true, then it is implied that there is a certain jeopardy at work while we still reside here in the earth. Uh, this is something that all those who cling to the notion of initial entrance into the kingdom being a guarantee of entering into that heavenly country need to carefully consider. Uh, what is exactly is the liability of being a man in the earth? Uh, what, what is it that would prevent us from continuing in the salvation that the Lord has began in us? Well, there, there's a few things that I could think of. That first of all, we reside in a body that is contrary to the Holy Spirit that we've been given. The, the flesh is a place that is not commodious to the new creature that we've been made in Christ Jesus. Our flesh is always at war with our desires towards God. There's never going to be a time when your flesh is going to agree with the process that you're going through. It has a downward propensity that would have an eroding effect upon any and all inclinations towards God if you just let it have its natural course. This is just the course of flesh is downward. And secondly, the land where we live is itself an enemy. It has been given over, as it were, to the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. See, the world has succumbed to the curse that God placed upon it when sin entered into the earth. To anyone who's serious about running the race that is set before them, it, it doesn't take long for you to realize that the, um, the, this world is not our home. In fact, it is set against us. Now, in the earth, we reside, as it were, in a, in a colony of heaven, and that we've been granted asylum in places such as the assembly. We have um, these oases, um, which we can resort to for nourishment, but we are still very much on the earth. These places are as embassies in a foreign land, which if they are not guard, guarded properly, they can be swiftly overtaken by the enemy. I, I was thinking about this. We see illustrations of this even in um, our uh, recent news. You know, I'm sure all of you have heard of this recent overtaking of this American embassy. And, and this is an example how quickly a determined enemy can overtake an ill-prepared and lightly guarded edifice in the land of the enemy. See, while we're yet on the earth, the environment itself will always be a, a point of potential peril to the saints. And in addition to this, to our enemy within and the danger of the land, we also have a whole host of principalities and powers who are set against us, who live in this earth. The, the least of whom greatly outmost, outmatch the most powerful of men, even the least of these, these principalities. And as the men who went spying in the land of Canaan, if, if we were going to take an inventory of the spiritual incumbents of this present evil world, we would find that the land is full of giants, it, it, it can, um, matched up against our own mortal strength. Uh, these things considered outside of the context of divine help would be enough to make even the most zealous, self-motivated man to fail for fear. If it is true that we've been delivered from the grip of the evil one, if we had to be delivered to begin with, then it's true that, that we must continue to be helped along the way if we're going to successfully make this journey that we have started on. Now, seeing as how we have all of these things that are against us, what exactly does it take to keep you from falling? What all is involved in that? You can be sure that this is not a, a, a simple thing. 
And what, what does it mean to be kept? What has God provided in order that we may overcome this multitudinous opposition that we have against us? Now, every point of jeopardy that I have just mentioned has more than adequately been accounted for by a divine provision. In every way, God has wholly and powerfully equipped man to overcome any and all adversity that is set before him. Firstly, our body, as, as Paul referred to it, the body of this death, and the redeemed, it's actually been inhabited by a spirit of life. See, we don't have to live according to the whim of the flesh because we have experienced the circumcision of Christ. See, we've been separated from this body and identity, and we've been freed from it and its domination over it. So we, we've, we've crucified the flesh, and it only remains that we keep it there. You know, the, the flesh, it will call down to you from the cross. Hey, just cut me some, let me, just let me have a, get a hand loose, you know. Uh, this is something that we can do for ourselves. We can point, hey, your flesh is getting off the cross. It's got a hand loose. You've got to nail that thing back on there. That's something that we can, we, we can do for one another. This, this, the, the flesh, we got to keep it on the cross. We have to continue to be crucified. One of these days it's going to die, but in, in, in the meantime, it's, it's going to wiggle and it's going to writhe as much as it possibly can. And although we reside in the land of the enemy, even now we have been granted access to a heavenly realm where we are free from the molestation of the wicked one. We, we have these, these heavenly places in Christ Jesus that we can resort to, to where we, we can be too hot high for him to get to us. Now, however, to those with an inclination towards this once saved thing I mentioned before, in our text we can see that God is not dragging an unwilling and an uninvolved populace to glory. Uh, his power is not primarily employed in salvation as it was in the creation. See, God didn't say, let there be the bride of Christ, and there was the bride of Christ. See, he's, he's employed power and might, but in the interest of displaying the wisdom of how he uses the power. And furthermore, in our text, being kept by the power of God does not imply inaction on the part of those who are being kept. It's true that from the perspective of eternity, after the race is over, after the, the jeopardy is gone and the world has passed away, we'll be able to say salvation is of the Lord. We'll be able to say there's, there's nothing that we, it, it was all the Lord. But yet residing in the present, we just can't simply rely on God to do everything for us. It's, it's not that simple. It's not God's desire to call many unwilling, obstinate men to glory, but many sons. See, God does the keeping, but he does, so, he does so through a means, not by a raw exercise of power, but by working in willing participants. See, we are kept by his power as God works in us, not on us, to will and to do of his own good pleasure. And this is through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed. Now, it should not be taken for granted today that you have faith. Too many people in the professed church of our day think of faith as a product of man. Uh, this faith that we're speaking of, the faith of God, is not merely a strong persuasion and a trust that you put in something. It is something that God has given you. It is a spiritual endowment of insight and assurance. In the text this evening, it is the means by which God powerfully keeps you. Now, since this is the case, that faith finds its genesis in God, then it must be sustained by God, and it must be continued in by the person who, has been, who it's been given. Now, as, as we're going through the comments this morning, um, uh, we, talk about, we talked about this, and I, I thought about this verse in Isaiah chapter 1. I read this differently than I've ever read it before. He says, Come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. But that's not the end of it. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword. Now, our willingness to continue in the Lord should not be assumed. This is not something that you should take for granted. There was a time when you were anything but willing Godward. 
God has made you willing in the day of his power. See, he, he, he promises in Psalms, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Uh, this is the difference in between uh, those under the new covenant and those under the old covenant. Uh, you Actually, technically, you could have went through the motions. You could have, um, all, that laundry list of all the things that you shouldn't do, you could have been very outwardly righteous but not wanted to do it, and it didn't count. See, he has given you, the Lord has made you to be willing. He has given you faith to believe. He's been giving you a means to overcome deception and discouragement. Now your part is to enter into what he has given you. Be, to be workers together with him. Do not forsake the provision. In other words, just don't refuse it. That is your part. That is your part. Now, in the end, when all men stand before the judgment seat of Christ and are called to give an account, there's not going to be one man who can say, there was no provision given, given to me. I didn't have a provision offered to me. No, they'll have to stand before an assembled universe and they'll, say, they'll have to say, I refused. That's the reason why I'm not in is because I refused. I would not allow this man to rule over me. And that's, that's the reason why. So then Paul in our text does not assume that those who have been once delivered faith will continue in it. And it's, I don't, it's not a good practice for us to do so either. This is something that has to be tried. It has to be proved. So he says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory. In fact, the Apostle Paul in his epistle to the Corinthians, he exhorted them, prove, prove your faith to see whether or not it was genuine. This is something that all believers must do in 2 Corinthians. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Amen. Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you except ye be reprobates? Amen. See, do you really have the genuine article? This isn't something that should be assumed. Examine yourselves. See if what God has promised faith would do is being worked out in you when you if when you examine yourself if you find that that's not the case then just be honest and get the real thing i, I think there's there's too much pretension going on when people people have actually made god a liar yeah. because they've examined themselves and they haven't seen the results that the lord said was he was going to work out and they they just made an excuse for it they said well you know god understands and you know how we are no just be honest just say i don't have it and get it but if you're doing well, if this, if this is what you see when you examine yourself and, and you see another brother that's doing well, well, exhort him and, and continue to examine yourself so that, that uh, you might be able to stay sober and increase in this thing. Now, we live in a generation that thoroughly despises the idea of faith being tried. They really do. I fear that there's, like I, like I just said, there's too much pretension in the church today. I've actually heard... Um, uh, men are teaching their con congregations to presume upon faith as if that was a given. And uh, using this very text, I've heard messages from preachers say, well, we're kept by the power of God through faith, and, and God's not going to allow his faith to fail. So if he's given you his faith, then you're one of those people that said that Jesus, uh, uh, Jesus is not going to lose. That's, that, that's what they teach. That's the way that they preach this text. That faith is the seal of God's keeping, and all those who have been given faith, well, they're, they're never going to fall. Well, if this is the case, then there are many words of exhortation concerning this very subject that we might, they might as well not even be there. Uh, whenever you read these, they don't mean anything to you if this is what you have accepted. Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, um, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Well, that sounds good, doesn't it? But that's not the end of it. If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. In 1 Corinthians 16, he says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you like men and be strong. And 2 Timothy, he, he, he exhorts them, That good thing that was committed unto you, keep it by the Holy Ghost that dwelleth in us. See, it is possible for your faith to become shaken. If it were not, they would not have given these words. It is possible for you to move away from the hope which was once burning so bright within you. 
If it wasn't, then why these words of warning? How about this one in Hebrews? This is serious. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. It... it, and in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, by the which also ye are saved, if, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. See, it, it is possible to believe in vain. Now, having established this, however, the apostle in our text, he is presenting the alternative of this. this. You don't have to do this. You don't have to fall behind. You don't have to fail in time of trial and make shipwreck of your faith. Um, it actually is possible to have your faith purified. It's, it's, it's possible to have your faith perfected in you, to be tried, to be found unto glory and honor, even at the appearing of Jesus Christ. See, this is how potent faith is. This is how effective and adequate faith is. That on that day when the wicked will fail for fear at the brightness of his coming uh, and all of his glory and the glory of the holy angels, when men are calling for rocks to fall upon them and to hide them from the radiance of his glory, on that day you can be found acceptable. See, you can be found unto praise and glory even on that day. You, you can be one that who can abide the day of his coming, to, to be glad, actually be glad at the revelation of his majesty and to, to not be ashamed on the day when, when Jesus comes again. This is uh, um, part of what we prayed about tonight, to be ready for the coming of the Lord, to be looking for the mercy, Just like Brother Robert um, gave us this morning. As he continues on, he says, Whom ha- having not seen you love, and I, I, I just want to focus um, on this phrase, receiving the end of your faith. You rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith. Now, I love this expression in the scripture where we're like transported to the end of the journey. And it's, it's almost like it's spoken of in the present tense, almost as if we were experiencing it right now. See, it's, it, it speaks of the assurance of these men. who They were actually able to see the goal with such clarity that they were able to speak of it this way. There's another example of this in Romans chapter 8. Um, where Paul says, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. See, he says it as if it already happened. This, this is how sure he is of, of, of the purpose of God, that he knows those he's justified, he glorified. Yeah. And Peter in our text speaks in a similar way of, of this rejoicing and receiving the end of our faith. Now, when we receive that for which we have been waiting, um, I, we talked about this earlier today, and um, there's a sense in which there will no longer be a use for faith as we now know it. See, faith will become sight. It will no longer be the substance of things hoped for because we'll have what we have hoped for. It, it will no longer be the evidence of things not seen because they will, they will be the things which are seen then. It, it will be replaced by a higher form of reliance upon God. Just as faith led us to trust in our God and to forsake the world, to look towards the conclusion of our time upon the earth and the new heavens and the new earth, we will forever trust and rely upon him to lead us into the work that awaits us in the world to come. And in our text, Peter describes the goal or the destination, the the finish line of our journey of faith in this world to be even the salvation of your souls. Now, in the present, it can really only be said that we are one-third saved, if, if I can say it that way. See, we, we've been given a new spirit. Our hearts and our minds are new, but we have a soul that tends downward, and we have a body that rebels against the law of our mind. And, but when we receive the end of our faith, when we get to the, the goal to which faith has been leading us all of our lives, we have this hope of the resurrection to look forward to. We'll, we'll be given glorious bodies. But even more than that, what, what actually makes us individuals and not just one of the host of the redeemed men is our soul. 
See, we will have a redeemed soul. This is part of the glory of our salvation, that it's you that's being saved. Yeah. God isn't, isn't calling a bunch of robots. Um, I, I, having said that, I understand that primarily our function in the world to come is seen within the context of our place in the body as, as a part of the bride of Christ. In, in the world to come, we'll, we'll have like two identities. We'll have a corporate identity. When uh, Jesus talks about this in Revelation 3, him that overcometh, well, I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more more out and I'll write upon him the name of my God. There's the first name. And the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down from out of heaven from my God, and I will write upon him my new name. But that he's not done with the writing yet. See that we're not going to be a massive group of automatons. See, there will also be a unique identity that each of us have. To him that overcometh, will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saveth he that receiveth it. See, so this very aspect of the world to come, it, it can it can actually be a motivation to you to do all that you can to store up treasures for yourself in heaven. Because because it's it's true that we will have a place in the heavenly Jerusalem, but it's also true that we are not all going to have the same reward. See, to the degree that you have availed yourself of the things that have been given to you in this world, uh, um, the Lord talks about this in the parable of the sower. You know, when the seed fell on the good ground, it brought forth fruit, some hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. And if you uh, um, correlate that with Luke 19, whenever he talks about the, uh, um, the talents, um, well, well, thou good servant, because thou have been faithful in a very little, thou have, have authority over ten cities. And he told the other one, have authority over five cities. So there, there's a sense in which in the world to come, we're, we're, d depending on how much we have availed ourselves in this world, we will have a, a greater reward. So that, that, that's, that's something that it can be a motivating factor for you in this world. Well, thank you, brother. And that's all. Amen.